I'm asked to conferences to present a paper on enhancement. Um, I'm usually asked to give or I'm expected to give a paper along the lines of why enhancement is okay, or why enhancement is good, or maybe even why enhancement is morally obligatory. That's not the paper that I'm going to give today. You'll all be relieved to hear. The conference is entitled New Perspectives in Bioethics, and so I want to do something that's a little bit new. My intention in this paper is to engage with arguments that draw on the concept of the artificial, as in the title of this session, and what you might see as its binary opposite, the natural. What I want to do is re-examine the ways in which these concepts are being used in discussions of human enhancement, particularly new neuroenhancements. I aim to explore how aspects of new neurotechnologies and the ethical discourse surrounding them further problematise existing concepts in the enhancement debate, including that of enhancement itself, as well as the natural artificial binary and the use of arguments based on human nature. I'm going to focus on two examples in the field of neuroenhancement, one by reference to the topic of this morning's discussion, and indeed uh, much of this afternoon's discussion, and that's moral enhancement, particularly neurochemical moral enhancement. Another mode of neuroenhancement that has been the subject of eth ethical debate for a little longer <coughs> is physical or electronic modification of the brain, so for example brain chips and implantable devices. And in comparing the issues raised and the ways in which ethical arguments relating to the natural, the artificial and human nature are deployed across these two related but distinct areas may, I hope, reveal some insights that are common to both. So I'm going to start just by very quickly laying out two positions on enhancements that are often cast in opposition, and these relate to the positions that Boyin talked about in his paper. So position one, and this is the one that I usually give the paper about, is we are already enhanced humans. And by, um, by analogy, enhancements that we might choose to pursue are simply part of this, this continuum that we're on. So this is often illustrated by reference to examples of existing technology that increase human capacities or change what we think of as normal or species typical, such as vaccination, modern medicine, uh, spectacles, etc. Other assertions that are commonly associated with this position include that there's no moral significance to the norm or the normal, Therapy and enhancement lie on a continuum, and at the individual level, they're morally indistinguishable. So that's one position. The other, what I would see as opposing position, is that enhancement technologies, or at least some of them, and which subset of enhancement technologies you, you choose depends on your view, but some enhancement technologies are either unnatural, against human nature, or would represent some presumably unacceptable alteration to human nature, and therefore shouldn't be done. Now, these two positions do tend to align respectively with the bioliberal and the bioconservative, but that is not as <coughs> right as it may seem. Regarding arguments surrounding human nature and enhancement, I think appeals to human nature and the primacy of the natural to reject some forms of enhancement but not others can't succeed unless they provide first an account of what is meant by human nature and the natural, second, showing how the enhancements in question contravene this, and third and most importantly, demonstrating that the account that's given of human nature or what is natural has some moral force. Now, I don't believe that anyone's successfully done this so far, but it's not my intention here to analyse and dissect those arguments. There are still those who support arguments against enhancement that are based on the moral force of the natural, but as I believe Persian doctors used to say, with this affliction I will not contend, at least not today. However, a weaker form of the naturalistic argument assumes that what is natural is likely to be better, even if it has no moral priority as such. So what occurs in nature or the way the world currently is, is taken to be better for us, or at least likely to be. And I think that in its weaker form, this argument crops up in some unexpected places, as we shall see. So, moral enhancement. One possibility that's come under consideration recently is the use of neurochemicals that have been shown to have an effect whether we view it as enhancing or otherwise, on moral behaviour. One reason why I've chosen neurochemical moral enhancement um, as a possibility to look at is that much of the research so far examines the effect of naturally occurring biological agents at levels that are within the naturally occurring spectrum of human possibility. Through this, I think we are able to re-examine the influence of the natural in arguments over moral enhancement. What I also want to do in relation to moral enhancement is to explore the relationship between morality and emotion in order to question the use of human nature arguments in discussions over what is moral and what would therefore enhance morality. Now, for the purposes of this consideration, I'm going to concentrate on the example we were discussing this morning, which is the effect of serotonin on so-called moral behaviour. 
I think John's laid out that position pretty well, so I won't go into it in detail. But in summary, what we've argued is that serotonin, because it strengthens emotional reaction at the expense of reasoning, may actually be considered a moral dehancer if you subscribe to the particular account of morality that, that we put forward. What I want to argue is that this position, which um, John and I have developed together in relation to the experiments regarding serotonin, I don't think that this position entirely jibes with the objections to moral enhancement that John has raised elsewhere. Let me explain. In a critique of the arguments that Tom raised in one of the very first papers on the topic of moral enhancement, John has suggested that there are some things to which strong aversions are constitutive of sound morality. And he cited um, Strawson's famous work on freedom and resentment in support of this. So Strawson says it wouldn't be moral not to feel antipathy to those who unjustifiably harmed our loved ones. In other words, some emotions align with morality. I suppose Bernard Williams's drowning wife, or not his drowning wife, but the drowning wife, is another example of this. So I think the argument here, as John has presented it um, in one of his other papers, is that any modulation of strong aversions would have difficulty distinguishing between these strong aversions that he argues are constitutive of morality and the kind of things it's bad to have strong aversions to, and that's Tom's examples of um, un unjustified discrimination such as racism. So a modulation that removed the strong aversions <coughs> that were constitutive of sound morality would not be a moral enhancement. But I think this doesn't fit well with the account of morality and what it is to be moral that we've more recently begun to develop in relation to the serotonin research. So our, our argument regarding the serotonin experiments implies that the locus of morality in the whole process of from thought um, through to action is the reasoning step. In this account of what it is to be moral, where is the place for emotions? Now, of course, emotions can either support or controvert moral reasoning so there are some things that in which um, they are aligned with moral reasoning and other things in which they are against it. But I think that if some strong aversions happen to overlap with sound morality, that is a fortuitous coincidence. The aversions themselves cannot be said to be constitutive of sound morality any more than the decisions of Molly Crockett's serotonin-influenced research subjects to avoid harming the person immediately in front of them at the expense of more distant persons can be said to be moral behaviour. Now, I'll come back to this involvement of the emotions later on, but I want to ask another question. When is a moral enhancement not a moral enhancement? Another reason that I think moral enhancement is interesting is that it forces us to reconsider our definition of enhancement. So liberal defenders of enhancement, which I know includes many of the people in this room, often support the idea that individual choice about what is good for us should be supported and justify enhancements as an aspect of our freedom to pursue the good life. But the prospect of moral enhancement, I think, throws this into question. In what sense do we mean the good life? Is it the life in which we are good or the life which is good for us? Is it actually good for us to be good or is it better for others? If I follow, for example, one of Tom's shortcuts to morality and be become inclined to give all my money to charity, I am at least materially worse off. Whether I am following the good life as a result, I think, is questionable. Or consider the example of type A versus type B personalities. Now, type Bs are more altruistic, they're more cooperative, they display more of what we might call moral tendencies, but type As are the ones who tend to succeed more in life, to have higher incomes, to rise higher in their careers, and so forth. So thus, moral enhancement, perhaps unlike other forms of enhancement that have been previously considered, problematizes the definition of enhancement with which we've hitherto been working, which is enhancement as something that is good for us individually. A further question, and one that reveals, or at least cautions against, an implicit invocation of the natural in the foregoing analysis, is the one I raised this morning. Why should we assume that the endogenous level of serotonin present in our brains confers the optimum balance between being free to fall and being slaves to our emotions? If pro-social emotional impulses actually restrain us from being free to fall, then perhaps serotonin reuptake inhibitor inhibitors are actually what is required in order to maximise meaningful liberty. Let me highlight here another subtle influence of what I've been calling the weak naturalism argument. It's not morally better, but it just is better. The outcome is better. Another, another influence of this argument that's not often articulated and has come up a few times already today, and that's the presumption of non-interference. So a simple prescription for moral action is that we should do good things when we can and we should avoid doing bad things when we can. But what about when we just don't know? We are not agreed at the moment, for example, about what would make us morally better or whether becoming morally better would be better for us. That being the case, is it worse to do something than to do nothing? If one is caught between two conflicting courses of action, 
to meddle or not to meddle, perhaps. <coughs> Our intuition might be to think, if I don't do anything, it's not my fault. But of course, if a modification is at worst neutral, then there is no harm done. So unless we have proof as to whether one course of action or the other is better, I don't think we can say the presumption should be in favour of non-interference. Of course, if we buy Ingmar's argument that it's easier to do harm than good, when we don't know, then we should probably never do. But this, as John argued in his comment, perhaps also relies on unwritten assumptions about the givenness of the status quo. Things are the way they are, and we can only act to change them, as opposed to the reality, which is that we are constantly acting to create the world around us by action or inaction. Let me talk now about moral perfection and human nature. So this is where I'm going to look at the relationship between emotions and morality to identify a role for human nature in the moral enhancement debate that maybe hasn't been elucidated so far and that I want to question. Most generally accepted accounts of morality allow that it's not always wrong or morally blameworthy to fail to do what is right or morally best. So this is sometimes described as weak impermissibility versus all-in impermissibility. I said earlier that... Um, John's paper in which he refers to Strawson argues that some strong emotions are necessary to morality. For example, our tendency to, to want to protect our families. One can think, though, of cases in which those same emotions would be counter to morality. Um, and I think you brought up the example this morning um, where the one who to be pushed under the trolley is one's own child. Now, we can say that a mother could not be blamed for failing to harm her own child in order to save many others in such a situation. Similarly, one would choose to rescue one's own child from the burning hospital rather than the five others in the next door ward. But that doesn't mean it's the morally optimum choice. Nevertheless, we allow for this sort of behaviour within our account of publicly acceptable morality. We create a special case of vicious choices that one should not have to make. A generalisable, consistent account of morality in these cases entails us accepting that we are not morally perfect beings, so there's some wiggle room for us perhaps to be imperfect. But if this is so... Should we reject the sort of moral enhancement that might at least have the potential to make us less imperfect? And this is where I want to question our intuitions about human nature and morality in this enhancement debate. So John's argument feels very persuasive. I think we'd be appalled at the suggestion that a person, a person should feel no special obligations to family members and be willing to push them under the trolley for others. That would be terrible. Or that we should be indifferent to the perpetrator of, of harm to a loved one, as in Strawson's example. But this is the key. It feels right. It feels that this is the way morality should be. But when we analyse it rationally, it's very difficult to justify as a generalisable, consistent principle, except by introducing agent, relative or vicious choice exceptions to the rule when it comes to one's nearest and dearest. And these sorts of exceptions, these reasons, seem to be generated in order to justify our intuitions. We are prepared to forgive moral imperfection in this regard. But forgiving imperfection is a very different thing to clinging on to it, even when we have the option to overcome this weakness. But that seems to be what this line of argument taken, taken to its end says we should do. We would not be moral if we, if we did not. We would not be moral if we gave up those strong emotions. Indeed, we probably think it would not be human to be able to exercise such perfect rational capacities to overcome our emotional impulses to protect those close to us and about who, whom we care. In short, it would not be human not to prefer one's own family over a stranger. But how and why is it part of essential human nature to be morally imperfect? When, in the context of other enhancements, we reject claims that finitude, as per Leon Cass, fallibility and limitations are an essential part of human nature, how can we claim that in the area of mor morality they are an essential part of it? What balance between reason and emotion constitutes natural human morality and in the broader context that I'm looking at it, to what extent are we letting the ghost of the concept of human nature haunt our bioethical debates over moral enhancement? I'm going to leave that question hanging there and move on to my second example, which is that of, the, um, of cyber enhancement. And this, I think, casts a new light on the artificial as the non-biological. So the moral enhancement problem raises, I think, quantitative questions sliding scales of what we consider to be the best level of neurochemicals to achieve optimum morality and how that might relate, if at all, to the naturally occurring levels of those chemicals. It is more straightforward, at least at first pass, to, to distinguish the natural from the artificial in my second comparator case of cybernetic neuroenhancement. So by this I mean machine-mediated enhancement, including electronic and computer technology, 
both external, such as cars, internal, such as pacemakers, as well as those enhancements that lie on the boundary, such as prosthetic limbs, which may or may not be controlled by brain-machine interfaces. Now, in the case of neurochemical moral enhancement, serotonin and other neurotransmitters are naturally occurring biological products, though we may modulate them by artificial means. But in the case of physical, mechanical cyber enhancement, no one was ever born with a silicon chip in their brain, at least not yet. So the non-biological is clearly artificial within this context. The question I want to address first with respect to these is how do we react to the incursion of the artificial in the cyber enhancement context? What I want to suggest is that many of the concerns about and the objections to cyber enhancement fall out along the lines of what I call the body as boundary. That is, we tend to treat external cyber enhancements differently to internal ones. What I want to show in relation to that argument is that this boundary is by no means, in fact, established, solid and impermeable. So objections to internal versus external enhancements on the basis of that classification alone are spurious. But then I want to consider that although the concerns do fall on this boundary, it's correlative rather than causative. So there are other reasons why they align in this way. Okay. So, does breaching the bodies of the physical boundary in the boundaries of the physical body in order to introduce a cyber enhancement constitute a transgression of some moral boundary? Well, if you look at how others have described the concerns associated with implantable technologies, it does seem that this is indeed a major, if not the sole, objection to these types of interventions. So, Maguire and McGee, for example, say that electronic equipment implanted within human bodies might replace, augment and enhance those most human of faculties, our memory and our ability to reason. In fact, I think the internal-external divide is inscribed not only in our attitudes towards implantable cyber enhancements, but towards other forms of enhancement, chemical and biological, as well as mechanical and physical. So consider the words of Stephen Rose on chemical cognitive enhancement. In the context of substances that interact directly with our bodily biochemistry, we feel a considerable unease. Now, of course, unease is not in itself a moral objection, but it does seem clear that concerns about bodily integrity and interfering with the body underlie many of the worries about internalised cyber enhancement technologies. Why might this be? Well, first, it would seem that internal interventions do expose the subject to greater physical risk. So our bodily integrity, the physical boundary of our body, represents in some ways our defence against the outside world. So the legion of microbes that threaten to assail us whenever that boundary is breached, the external environment that's often hostile and outside our control, whereas within our skin we carry around our own personal homeostatically regulated microenvironment. There's also a greater degree of permanence, so it's much harder to take out an implanted chip than it is to take off a wristwatch or put down a smartphone. It seems facile, though, to say that internal, um, internal interventions will necessarily be more risky, even though they tap into deeply held intuitions about bodily integrity. So plenty of external enhancements pose significant risk to those who choose to adopt them, fast cars, for example. And as for permanence, the external environment can wreak changes on the physical body, not just in obvious passive ways such as acquiring a suntan or suffering injury in a natural disaster, but through the active use of external devices or enhancements, and these can be to the brain as well. A well-used um, well example in this context is the effect on the brains of London taxi drivers that they're acquiring the knowledge. And these can be equally as permanent as direct internal interventions. So neither on the grounds of risk nor permanence do we have justification to say that internal cyber enhancements are qualitatively different. Does it and should it make a difference to us whether a technology is inside the body or outside it? Well, one example that I've used informally in relation to this, um, this question for a long time is that of mobile phones and laptop computers. We rely on these devices, they enhance us, we can put them down or switch them off or go away from them, but at the same time we tend to feel them as part of our normal or ideal way of being in the world. And I think this, um, this relates to ideas that James proposed about the exocortex. So the blurring of the internal and external boundary goes far beyond obvious parallels in consequence and effect. Tool use reconfigures the brain to recognise external tools as part of the body. We can also have certain neuropsychological conditions that fail to recognise parts of the physical body as oneself. So our brain's own image of our bodies and our feeling of our bodies as us is essentially malleable. Our understanding and experience of ourselves as embodied humans intrinsically includes our interaction with assorted technologies, no matter on which side of our skin, the inside or the outside, they are located. OK, will cyber enhancement change human nature? Consider this quote regarding brain-machine interfaces. Brain-machine interfaces will put new forms of stress on what it means to be human. 
And the ways in which it's suggested they might do this is that they might um, enable us for a start to be constantly logged onto the internet, um, bestow fluence in a new language, enable recognition of previously unmet individuals, provide nearly instantaneous access to encyclopedic databases. It promises to change the capacities of humans to such a degree that they become fundamentally different. So this is the change to human nature that's proposed in the context of this neuroenhancement. If we look at some of the features that I, are identified here though, for example, face recognition in comparison to the software on tools like Facebook that automatically tags people, or encyclo encyclopedic databases compared to our use of Google and other tools which we already have, it becomes clear, I think, that we are already fundamentally different and the ways in which we engage with and understand the world are different. So the quality and the nature of our knowledge and our being have changed. It's not actually against our nature to take technologies, whether internal or external, on board as part of ourselves um, and our bodies. So I think as far as cyber enhancements produce changes that we should worry about, they're changes not to the human form necessarily, not to whether something is inside us or outside us, or whether it is the artificial um, encroaching onto the natural. They are changes to human society. And this leads me on to what's my, almost my final point, that one potentially important difference between external cyber enhancements, such as computers, the internet and phones and so forth, which we mostly accept, and internal cyber enhancements, such as brain chips, brain machine interfaces, and other direct physical interventions into the brain, which are often subject to question, is that enhancements in the latter category, internal enhancements, require usually medical assistance to mediate, to introduce, and if necessary, to remove. Now, this does raise a broader question. Why are doctors or healthcare practitioners the ones who are uniquely privileged to interfere with bodily integrity? And one possibility, I suppose, is that there is a desired relationship between levels of risk and expertise that are involved in the uptake of a new technology, as well as accountability. But I think that this observation tells us something about our concerns regarding neuroenhancements. Perhaps our concerns are less about classifying enhancements as artificial or natural than about how enhancement te technologies are mediated and who the mediators are. So to go back to our case of moral enhancement and neurochemical enhancement, many of the concerns that have been raised relate not least to the prospect of involuntary or coercive use of these drugs as potential anti-antisocial behaviour agents. I think a lot of our objections to the potential use of these drugs would be less if they were taken out of the potentially coercive context. So if, for example, we wanted to make ourselves less moral in the reasoning sense, um, would we be wrong to do so? If, I, I can't imagine a scenario right now, but you can think of ways in which you might want to turn off the reasoning and turn up the emotion a bit. Would we be wrong to do that? But should we be free to do that? What is it that makes us want to be good? So I think it's, it's not the means of enhancement, but the means by which we access the means of enhancement and the control that we have over this that matters to us. Medical expertise is invoked in the internal-external debate over cyber enhancement and also some forms of chemical cognitive enhancement and it hence becomes problematic in this context. So the, the idea of cosmetic neurology, the question to which doctors should, how far doctors should go in being mediators of this, whether doctors should be the gatekeepers to chemical cognitive enhancement, these are all questions that reflect, I think, that, that issue. The spectre of political control is invoked in the case of moral enhancement. Who decides for us that we should be good or compels us to be good? And in both cases, the locus of control of the technology is elsewhere or is threatened to be elsewhere. So just to conclude, I've attempted here to contrast two novel forms of neuroenhancement, chemical moral enhancement and cybernetic cognitive enhancement, and to show how these and bioethical arguments in respect of them relate to concepts of the artificial, the natural and human nature. I think there are implications of this, perhaps especially for bioliberals in the moral enhancement debate, in terms of how we conceive of enhancement, how we apply arguments regarding artificial, natural, and human nature in terms of these new neuroenhancements. And finally, I've suggested that we need to refocus arguments about enhancement on the means of accessing technology rather than on the subject of whether it's natural or artificial. So our common concern in both the areas that I talked about, and probably in enhancement more generally, relates to how the technology is mediated and who those mediators are. And as such, it's essentially a political now rather than a moral question about who has control and who, who holds the power. And thus the enhancement debate, the neuro-enhancement debate too, moves somewhat out of the realm of pure moral philosophy and firmly into the political. And some, of course, would argue that it already is and always has been there, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you.